So a few months ago, I did a video on why Nolan's Batman is objectively the worst one in all of recorded human history ever. Objectively. Ever. And much to my delight, my clickbaiting actually worked. And all of the Nolan nerds filled with the kind of impotent rage that only someone who spent the last decade or so jacking it to Joker posters can muster, cracked their knuckles, pulled out the ergonomic keyboards, and regurgitated the same tired arguments I've been hearing for the past 10 years. Your normie cuck brain just can't appreciate the deep philosophical themes presented by a man in an ill-fitting green blazer and clown makeup. Congratulations, you played yourself. Now the whole The Dark Knight made comics movie matter thing is just wild to me. It's like y'all forgot just a few months ago when every 30 plus comic reader in existence collectively nutted in their knickerbockers over seeing Tobey Maguire and spider themed spandex for the first time in 20 years. Okay, so I will give y'all this. Maybe you do have a point with the whole Nolan made comic movie serious thing. Except V for Vendetta actually exists. And FYI, it came out the same year that Batman Begins did. So go look it up before you clown yourselves in the comments. Now, understand something. I'm not trying to detract from the legacy of the Nolan verse or the impact that those movies had on cinema in general. I mean, it's pretty much thanks to the mainstream clout that those movies gave to comic themed films that 20 years later it was practically malpractice to not give Angela Bassett a Golden Globe for starring in a movie about a merman with wings on his ankles dressed like a gay porn star. The woke mob strikes again. I mean, Snyder pretty much just ripped off Nolan's formula for Man of Steel and the subsequent movie verse that it spawned. He just did it a lot worse than Nolan did. And no Snyder bros. One extra hour added on to this movie is not going to make up for all the bad that was already in it. Even if that extra hour is twice as good as the base game. Okay, I kind of see y'all's point now. That being said, I feel like the importance of the Nolan trilogy has kind of been overblown in the 10 years since it ended. Just like the Obama administration. But as much as I do dislike these movies for just how objectively terrible the titular Dark Knight is in them, objectively... And as much as I've said that I dislike the themes presented in these movies, the last two in particular, if we're going to keep it a buck, I think part of the reason why we look so fondly back on this trilogy is because most of what we got in sense kind of pales in comparison. Just like the Obama administration. See, my issue is in the perpetual hyperbole that is the social media age and our attempt to prop up the narrative of the Dark Knight being the greatest superhero movie ever. We have kind of neglected to give due diligence to one of my favorite comic book movies growing up and one of my favorite nostalgia trips today. Some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate up hill. Why God didn't allow this movie to be made today, I really don't know. Aside from him having no sense of humor whatsoever. But then again, this nigga wouldn't exist now, would he? The Blade franchise holds a special place in the hearts of many millennials, comic readers and non-readers alike, if for no other reason than just how of its time it is. Like, just look at this thing. The fight scenes, the soundtrack, the CGI. Like, how much more 90s can you get? Like, all you gotta do is throw a couple of Kooji sweaters and some Zubaz pants and you basically got yourself day two of high school spirit week. I mean, 
in what other decade could you have your main character dress up like something out of a Shadow the Hedgehog fanfic and we take him seriously? Now, as dated as this movie can be at times, especially in the VFX department, its value goes beyond just it reminding me of a time when I wasn't a walking anxiety attack. You know all of those reasons why people like to call The Dark Knight the greatest superhero movie of all time? Well, believe it or not, Blade did that first and did it with the greatest dialogue imaginable. Oh, the fuck are you out of your damn mind? God, I love the 90s. Ten. In the mid 80s, Marvel Comics were still selling like HGH to the Hodge twins. And because, well, capitalism, in 1986, Marvel caught the attention of Dr. Eve. I, I mean, Ron Perlman, who purchased Marvel that same year from New World Pictures. And yeah, that name is not a red flag at all. According to the website Den of Geek, two years later, Marvel went public and Perelman used his stake in the company to make a number of acquisitions, including a couple of trading card companies, Panini stickers, a distribution house called Heroes World, and most importantly for our story, Toy Biz, a manufacturer of discount furniture, obviously. In total, these acquisitions cost Marvel something around $700 million. Perelman's pitch was basically the 80s version of Forex, where they could buy low now and then sell at an unrealistically higher price later. The difference was that comics are actually a thing that you can use once you spend money on them. And so Perelman deduced that because comic readers like myself don't have lives, that if he just kept jacking the prices up, then we would gladly continue to shell out our coin for them. As a way to prove his theory, at one point, Perelman sold something like 40% of his shares and was able to sell them for, quote, exponentially higher than what he purchased the entire company for. The problem, aside from he just assuming that he could just hike the prices up however high whenever he wanted to, was that of simple supply and demand, a.k.a. freshman economics high school freshman. The still strong sales of Spider-Man, X-Men, and the X-Force were able to keep Marvel afloat into the early 90s. But just like a Led Zeppelin track played backwards, the devil was always in the details. Go look it up if you're too young to get that reference. See, part of the reason why X-Force sales were so strong is because Marvel employed a marketing gimmick in which they included a different collectible trading card with each copy of the first issue. So, as you would guess, collectors went about buying up as many copies as they could afford. Kind of like what Funko collectors do today with Chase variants. I should know, I've spent an embarrassingly large amount of money on these cute little bastards. So just as Neil Gaiman of Sandman fame predicted in 1993, the comic bubble which began to balloon in the 80s when the mainstream caught on to the idea of comics as an investable collectible and the comics industry predictably exploited that by churning out variant copy after special edition cover burst that same year just to give you an idea of just how badly this devastated marvel in 93 the price of a single share of marvel stock was 71 dollars and 83 cents in today's money by 1996 that price had plummeted to a little less than five dollars a share again in today's money this is why until his death in 2018, you could, practically speaking, get a Stan Lee autograph for a little more than a hamburger and a hand job. So yeah, Marvel's name was pretty much mud by the mid-90s. And this, of course, kicked off the legal battle that would define the now bankrupt company for the better part of that decade. Which, oddly enough, did wind up ending with Toy Biz and Marvel merging 
but none of the chief competitors actually coming out with ownership of either. Too bad this isn't WWE. So after all of the legal drama was finally settled, Marvel could now get to doing the one thing that they had dreamed of doing going all the way back to at least the early 80s. And that's make a movie for the big screen. A good one. In 1993, Avi Arad, the then CEO of Toy Biz, not only replaced Stan Lee as the head of Marvel Films, but also became executive producer for the X-Men animated series, which not only gave us the blueprint for pretty much all X-Men media moving forward, but also gave us the objectively greatest opening theme of all time. <laughs> objectively the reason this matters is as y'all who remember a time when top 40 hits actually use live instrumentation the x-men animated series was like the chief cornerstone of the after school fox block which for any millennial with cable was the closest thing to required watching that we had along with kids wb and abc disney's one saturday morning <laughs> We're all going to die soon. My point is, through the success of the animated series, Arad was able to secure a deal with 20th Century Fox to produce an X-Men movie. Yeah, the same X-Men movie that turned Wolverine into a male model instead of the five-foot-tall hunched-back gremlin he was supposed to be. But then the collector bubble burst. And movie studios weren't exactly chomping at the bit to produce a comic movie that wasn't called Batman. That is, until 96, when Marvel stock began to rebound, thus setting the stage for arguably the single most important Marvel product produced that's not called the X-Men opening theme. Objectively. Dracula don't suck. But let's 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 backtrack a little bit before we go any further, shall we? Back when Marvel was still owned by New World Pictures, there was actually a plan in place to produce a Western themed vampire hunter movie starring Richard Roundtree of all people. So yeah, basically the most seventies thing you've ever seen. And Marvel actually went to work producing this movie in 1992 with none other than LL Licked Lips Cool J drafted in for the leading role. And then one thing kind of led to another and Marvel kind of realized that, hey, we kind of already got a black vampire hunter on the roster. So why don't we just make the movie about him? And thus Blade was born. New Line Cinema was brought in to actually make the movie and David S. Goyer was drafted to write the script while Stephen Norrington was drafted to direct the movie. Originally, New Line wanted to make a spoof film, even at one point suggesting to make Blade a white guy. But Goyer and Norrington said up yours and went about as best as could be expected with a freaking vampire movie after all grounding the thing in reality depicting vampirism as a disease and not a mythical curse or whatever now around the same time wesley blackest man in hollywood snipes was as about as hot a negro could be in tinseltown well i mean aside from that time richard pryor lit himself on fire but that's a whole nother video for another day now those of y'all who might not be hip to Blur deep lore rumors have been going around since the og dream team of a black panther movie being produced 30 years before chadwick boseman introduced us to the universal sign for blackness see wesley was not only supposed to star in this movie but he basically spearheaded the campaign to get it made in the first place kind of makes his whole escape to africa arc a little more meta than it ever needed to be done it but you see, the problem was the crew could never find a script that they liked and a director that they liked just as much at the same time. That on top of the fact that Hollywood execs had 
I guess never read an Avengers comic just assumed that when they heard the words Black Panther that Wesley was trying to make Judas and the Black Messiah pretty much killed the project dead in the water but in Snipes' words serendipitously he along with fellow 90s Hollywood heavyweights Denzel Washington and Samuel Fishburne were shortlisted to play the titular Blade. And according to Goyer, Snipes was the only one that was ever seriously considered. Still, it is kind of fun to think about what Malcolm X Vampire Hunter would have looked like. Not like there isn't a precedent. The first Blade movie was by all accounts a success, at least commercially. And though a lot of people like to point to this movie's 100 and $31 million global box office, double its $45 million budget, by the way, as the single solitary reason for Marvel pulling itself up out of bankruptcy in the late 90s. Marvel only made $25,000 from that movie because, again, this was a New Line Cinema production. If only they had maintained the rights to the IP. Well, that's basically what the big wigs at Marvel said once Blade has set the template for making comic book movies with mainstream appeal. The same template that Fox's X-Men and Sony's Spider-Man would follow to some degree. A template that would pretty much set the foundation for superhero movies going forward. Remember, during that time, Marvel was going through a liquidation and there were concerns that the whole company might fold. And it is my understanding that the film was a catalyst to its resurgence and the empire we see now. Now, like I said earlier, a lot of people like to credit the TDK trilogy for making superhero movies serious and no. I mean, the argument could be made that The Crow did that four years before Blade and more importantly gave us the objectively single greatest wrestling gimmick change of all time. Objectively. Now, while I won't argue with you if you say that The Crow made superhero movies serious, but I will fight you with my bare fist if you want to argue that it made superheroes grounded, because no, that most definitely was Blade. This is the reason why the writer and director kind of pick and choose the parts of Vampire Lord that they want to keep in and take out. So that's why Blade's baddies are immune to things like crosses and holy water. And they also have reflections. And they can also enter a room without being invited first. And evidently they can just say nope to daylight by putting on sunblock. Looks like your mascara's running. Like, what is this movie? I'm a huge comic book fan, and I always liked Blade as a character. I was so sick of the Anne Rice school of vampire films and literature, and wanted to go as far from Anne Rice as we could get. We tried to explain vampirism in medical terms. The approach is that vampires really exist. They aren't just Baroque characters. The Crow and 1997 Spawn especially were very much on the mature side, but still pretty heavily steeped in the supernatural, whereas Blade pretty much went out of its way to steer clear of any plot points that couldn't reasonably be pseudoscienced away. This is why Blade's not quite love interest in the movie is a hematologist and is somehow able to abscond away to the hospital where the night before she was attacked by an extra crispy corpse before being basically kidnapped by a big black dude in the baddest coat you've ever seen to go back and get a bunch of vials of anticoagulant that she can science into a anti-vampire serum or whatever without one person noticing or at least asking oh my god where have you been the last two days i thought you were dead <laughs> again what is this movie or maybe she just had it in her pocket the whole time <laughs> which somehow is even funnier 
Like, think about the other comic book movies that were being made around the same time. None of them really made an effort to steer clear of the comic bookiness of their source material. Now, I'm not sitting here and saying that playing the whole Van Helsing as told by Jean-Claude Van Damme thing doesn't bring the movie down a peg or two, but you can't argue that this isn't basically what superhero movies have been trying to do for like the past two decades at least, at least the non-Marvel ones. Like, I mean, that's what made Guardians of the Galaxy feel like such a breath of fresh air when it came out, right? Like, Gunn really didn't have a choice but to just buy into just how ludicrous the very concept of GOG is. Like, could you really sit there and imagine Rocket, who's basically a living science project himself, having to explain the biology of a living ficus to the audience? I mean, again, look at the comic book movies that matter during this time. As much as revisionist cinema historians like to associate Batman with the Bush administration, and like I pointed out in my Dark Knight video, I can kind of understand why a lot of folks do that. If any time period belonged to Bruce, it was the 90s. Like, we got three different live-action versions of Batman in the same decade. Not to mention the universally beloved and acclaimed animated series and the Batman Beyond spinoff, which are both pretty much just one big sequel to the objectively greatest Batman movie ever made, Mask of the Phantasm. Objectively. But everyone from Paul Dini to Burton didn't really try to steer clear of the more campy and comic-y aspects of the Batman mythos. Like, look at Penguin. He's supposed to be in his 30s in this movie. The Phantom, the Shadow, the Mask, even Spawn and the Crow, as dark and gritty as they were, were so because that's what the source material called for. None of those movies really veered too much away from the source material, except in the case of the mask, like really, really toning down the violence, like there was no way this movie was ever going to be made if they didn't kiddify it the way that it was. It really wasn't until Blade that you see a conscious effort being made to basically remake the character's mythos from the ground up. Like just compare Blade before to what he is after the movie came out. This is basically Wesley Snipes. Minus the tax fraud, obviously. Motherfucker, are you out of your damn mind? Okay, so let's back up again. Like I said, since the early 80s, Marvel had been struggling to get some of its biggest IPs on the big screen. And because Marvel wasn't in the movie making business itself, it wound up having to get in bed with a bunch of different Hollywood execs to make its dreams come true. So basically par for course in that line of work. This is why seeing Spider-Man in Civil War was such a humongous chungus deal and why we haven't seen anything like Avengers versus X-Men made into a movie or House of M unless you want to count Multiverse of Madness, which no, no, don't do that. You need the X-Men for those storylines. And until Walt Disney Destroyer of Worlds purchased Fox in 2019, all of those characters were off limits along with the X-Force, Deadpool, and any other characters associated with the X-Men mythos. Now, the question is, if Marvel in the 80s was still making more money than IG life gurus from dumb people, why would they auction off the rights to their most precious IPs to studios that fundamentally misunderstood the characters and the mythos surrounding them? Well, more money, obviously, specifically that which can be made from selling toys. So you got to understand during the 80s and 90s, some of the most beloved pop cultural kids icons were created for no other reason than to push product 
Matter of fact, this strategy works so well for companies like Mattel and Hasbro, Hasbro especially, that 20 years later, they just said, F it, let's do it again. And this time on the big screen. And also with the most racist robot caricatures you could imagine. Listen to you little punk act. I mean, what you have done for us except ding my rim? I hate these movies. Objectively. So my point is from Jump, Marvel knew that aside from the Saturday morning cartoon block, the best way to market their characters to the younglings was through movies. This is why we got that god-awful straight-to-video Captain America movie in 1990. Like I said earlier, Marvel made a pittance from Bleed despite its box office success. And also, like I said earlier, a deal with Fox had already been secured in the early 90s to produce an X-Men movie at some point. Now, X-Men aside, it was the success of Blade that convinced a bunch of studios to start a bidding war for some of Marvel's biggest IPs, or at least the ones that weren't already in some kind of entanglement like the Fantastic Four, which had been sold to Constantine Films in 1986, and then uh, another equally terrible direct-to-video movie was made in 1992 by New Horizon Pictures, which was associated with Constantine Films, and then Stan Lee had a big fit about it and said that Constantine only had the movie made so that they could maintain the rights to the characters and bing bang boom I, I honestly I don't want to get into it it's more messy than anything Jada Pinkett has been involved in or Lakeith Stanfeld secret family y'all gotta do better the biggest of these was obviously Spider-Man who Sony was able to secure the rights to, despite he somehow also being tied up in some kind of custody battle between Columbia Pictures and 21st Century Films, not to be confused with 20th Century Fox, by the way. But again, Sony was able to purchase the rights to the characters for a cool $7 million flat, along with 5% of the revenue generated from any movies made starring the character as well as a 50-50 split for merchandising. Because again, it's all about the toys, buckos. By the time the mid-aughts had rolled around, Marvel had pretty much sold off the rights to basically any character that mattered. This is why we got those early 2000s Marvel movies like Daredevil, Elektra, The Punisher, and Ang Lee's Hulk that still today even gets a lot of hate but honestly if you ask me might be the most comic accurate representation of bruce banner and his relationship with the not so jolly green giant dwelling inside of him because lord knows this ain't it and then the light went off at marvel specifically in the head of david mazel who then went up to the higher ups and said, you know, why don't we just cut out the middleman and push the product ourselves and keep all of the profits? Just like a drug dealer. The problem was Marvel was just a few years removed from having everything taken away from them by the feds. And so they really didn't have the capital to front their own venture. <laughs> just like a drug dealer. But sometime around 2005, Marvel did secure a deal with Merrill Lynch, a $525 million deal over a 10-year period to produce movies starring the characters that they sold off to everybody. And so Marvel, because they didn't really have anything else, offered the rights to Captain America and Thor as collateral, even though, again, they belong to somebody else at this time just like a drug and so marvel went about buying back the rights to at least the core avengers that they had sold off during the years so captain america thor the hulk black widow and most importantly iron man who since the early 90s had himself been passed around studio lots like a playboy in a junior high locker room you Zoomers really don't know how easy y'all got it. And the rest is pretty much history. But again, none of that would have happened if not for the success of the little vampire movie that could. 
Again, remember, it was specifically the success of Bleed that convinced Sony to buy Spider-Man. And it was the success of Bleed along with Sony Spider-Man and Fox's X-Men movie that was always going to get made anyway, but wouldn't have gotten nearly the kind of budget or buzz that it got without Bleed that basically gave us the superhero genre. X-Men deserves a lot of credit, but I must give just as much credit to Norrington, David Goyer, and Wesley Snipes for Blade. No one would have made a movie the size of X-Men without looking at Blade and saying, whoa, wait a second. 150 million box office worldwide on a character who is not totally known? But Billiam, you may be saying through your double steak grilled cheese burrito and Mountain Dew Baja blast induced malaise. How does any of this directly impact the Dark Knight trilogy? Well, suck it, Nolan nerds. I'm the goddamn Batman. Okay, so let's back back a little bit more, shall we? After the abject failure that was Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin, which itself was supposed to be something of a soft reboot of the character after the not quite as horrendous Batman Forever movie, Warner Brothers canned plans for a sequel to Schumacher's film titled Batman Unchained, which I'm going to keep it a buck with y'all, kind of sounds like a sex thing. But anyway, Warner Brothers then went about looking for a way to reboot its second most famous IP, even at one point drafting in Joss Whedon to write a screenplay, and then at some point just figuring that wasn't the direction that they wanted to go in. There was even a point where a Batman vs. Superman film was discussed like 15 years before we got it, until one of the writers that they consulted said that Batman vs. Superman is basically the thing that you do when you run out of ideas and you're just not creative enough to write yourself out of a corner. It's almost prophetic. Well, that writer in question was David S. Goyer. Yeah, the same David S. Goyer who wrote all three Blade scripts. So, at that point, Nolan and Goyer went about pulling from stories like The Long Halloween and Year One to create something for Batman that hadn't been done yet on the big screen. An origin story. Now, I understand that nowadays OSs are about as tired as mixed-race TikTok couples, but when you consider Nolan's almost complete disregard for the source material, plus Warner Brothers' desperate desire to reboot the character, and Goyer's already proven propensity to just rewrite parts of a character's mythos that he just doesn't like, this was basically inevitable. Funny joke. Now, with all of that context in mind, how can you seriously sit there and say that the Dark Knight trilogy did not at least, to some degree, bite off a of blade? Well, I mean, aside from terminal fanboyism, that is. Like, let's try to get down to some of the specifics, like the format in particular. Blade was always meant to be a trilogy, and again, in a post-MCU world, that's basically the standard, right? But consider some of the movies that came out around the same time as Blade with similar characters taking the lead. The Shadow, The Mask, Spawn, all only got one film. The Crow got two. And yeah, while Batman got four movies in one decade, aside from the first two, they were all pretty much their own thing. That's why the first two are the only ones that have any real continuity to them. And we can even take this back to Superman, who, yeah, did have like four different movies over the span of 20 years. But again, those were all pretty much standalone stories, which is why the fourth one sucked so badly. Blade, on the other hand, was always written to be a three-part production. 
this is why the movie kind of grinds to a halt in the 30 to 45 minutes following the objectively greatest character intro sequence in all of cinema history. Objectively. What the movie is doing is it's building its world for you. It's explaining the rules by which its universe abides. Not just for this film, but for any subsequent ones. This is why if you've ever seen Blade 2, which if you've had basic cable at any point over the past 15 years, there's really no excuse why you haven't. The movie just kind of dark souls you into its story not a bunch of world building not a ton of exposition no weird vampire pseudoscience just a bunch of mfs trying to ice skate uphill and blade pushing them right back down with their heads cut off so i already talked about how the three-part harmony thing really comes from blade but let's talk about the real reason why people like to call if not the entire trilogy then at least the dark knight the greatest superhero movie ever i hate to break it to you folks but the dark knight is not the first comic book movie to address political or philosophical themes i mean we already mentioned V for Vendetta, and that's completely disregarding the fact that you have a whole freaking X-Men franchise right there. But even if those two didn't exist, yeah, Blade did that first too. Like I said earlier, Goyer and Norrington tried as best as they could to portray vampirism as a natural, real-world occurrence. And thus, Goyer used vampirism as a vehicle to address biracial identity. And yeah, it's not lost on me at all how problematic equating in in-universe disease with race is. But then again, just as problematic is Mindy Kaling's and Kenya Barris' shared obsession with swirly love. And somehow they keep getting work. So I'm willing to forgive the 25-year-old comic book movie first is what I'm saying. I remember I came in and said, I'm going to pitch you the Star Wars of black vampire films. And so I pitched it as this racial animosity between the purebloods and the turned vampires, the young Turks like Deacon Frost. At the same time, I wanted to talk about race in a subversive way, and it played into this half-breed idea, if you will, to have one foot in each world and not be accepted by either one. This is most evident in the movie's main antagonist, Deacon Frost, who's reminded by every op at basically every opportunity that he wasn't born a vampire. Rather, he was bitten in, so to speak, unlike the rest of the vampire executive board of directors or whatever which apparently is a thing in this movie again what am i watching and again i didn't get this subtext when i was a kid but one i was like seven when the movie came out and two is about vampires for god's sakes but with all of that context taken into consideration the movie's commentary is even more on the nose than practically every joke in velma I really dislike this show. Despite, or maybe even because of this, Frost goes just as, if not harder, for the culture than any of his pure blood peers. Something that's really not uncommon among a lot of mixed race folks. And this theming isn't limited to him. Remember, Blade himself is half vampire, which is another little nugget that didn't exist before this movie. And thus, Frost's frustration with Blade stems from the fact that he not only rejects, but actively antagonizes his own people using their shared powers for no other reason than the possibility of accessing community with folks who probably still aren't going to accept him anyway. Yeah, there's a joke in here somewhere, but... Honestly, it's far too depressing to make. You think the humans will ever accept a half-breed like you? They can't. They're afraid of you. And they should be. You're an animal. You're a fucking maniac. 
Blade, on the other hand, loathes himself and what he is, actively repressing his vampirism, even at one point considering ridding himself of it altogether. Until at the end of the movie, he learns to make peace with himself and uses his powers to make one more good movie and then an absolute atrocity. Cock juggling thunder cunt! Like seriously, this thing is worse than any straight to sci-fi flick you've ever seen. And evidently, most if not all of the problems stem directly from the script. Like, the original director that they had signed on to do the movie, once he saw the script, evidently turned into this Spongebob meme and just noped his way out of there. And that's only the beginning of the problems. So apparently, when they couldn't find anybody to sign on to direct this catastrophe in waiting, Goyer just decided, forget it, I'll direct it myself. Now, remember how I said that nobody, and I mean nobody, was pleased with this script? Evidently, that was no more true for anyone else than the movie's lead himself. Matter of fact, Wesley, at the height of his Hollywood-induced hubris, was so displeased with it that he spent practically every waking moment on set doing everything in his power to sabotage the film. You know that one scene where Blade is laying on the examination table and his eyes kind of look like Jeff Hardy face paint? Well, that's because, practically speaking, that is what that is. Like, Wesley just straight up refused to open his eyes during this scene, so they literally had to CG them on. Also, allegedly, he tried to choke out the director. Allegedly. Probably. He tried to strangle the director, we went out that night to some strip club, and we were all drinking. And there were a bunch of bikers there, so David says to them, I'll pay for all your drinks if you show up to set tomorrow and pretend to be my security, and the next day, Wesley sat down with David and was like, I think you need to quit. You're detrimental to this movie. And David was like, why don't you quit? We've got all your close-ups, and we could shoot the rest with your stand-in. And that freaked Wesley out so much that, for the rest of the production, he would only communicate with the director through post-it notes. And he would sign each post-it note from Blade. So yeah, there's another little nugget. Blade is barely even in Blade Trinity. Like, any scene that you don't see Wesley's face, that's either a stunt double or a stand-in. Like, there's one sequence where they literally use the same shot of Wesley three separate times during the same scene. Also, Ryan Reynolds is in this movie and he's doing his whole Deadpool thing like 12 years before Deadpool. And as you'd expect, it's really annoying in any movie that's not called Deadpool. Precious in me. Well, that depends who you ask because clearly this dog has a bigger dick than you. And when the fuck did you see my dick, fuck face? Ow! I was talking to her! Also, Triple H is in this movie. And his character is almost as pointless as the booking during his reign of terror. Almost. Like, he's so pointless that the only reason I even bring him up is to ask, of all of the Attitude Era main eventers, why did y'all pick Paul? Like... I know The Rock was unavailable because he was right at the beginning of his Conquest of Hollywood arc. And Stone Cold, if we're going to keep it a buck, is about as good of an actor as an actual stone. But Chris Jericho was right there. You mean to tell me that he couldn't have made this movie or Ryan's Wisecracks, for that matter, ten times more bearable by just balancing out the one-liner ratio between light and dark side? Have y'all not seen this promo? The moss covered three-handled family gradunzel. Like seriously, just the fact that they were able to even finish this film is Oscar worthy in itself. And if y'all do want some more in-depth analysis into the actual movies themselves, then I suggest you go watch Cosmonaut Variety Hours video because honestly, most of the stuff in the third movie I missed the first time. And I wouldn't have caught it again if I hadn't watched that video. But all of that being said, I'm not sitting here and saying that the Blade 
franchises, the Godfather trilogy or anything like that. Honestly, when I first started writing the script, I really didn't know what direction I was going to go other than this just being a really general retrospective on one of my favorite childhood films of all time and don't ask me why I was allowed to watch this at seven but do ask why I am now the most emotionally well human being you have ever seen I think that the impetus for me making this video was my disappointment in hearing about the new Mahershala Lab Blade now being in some kind of development purgatory if not straight up hell and really more people need to watch this movie and love it like me. And yeah, I will give you that it's dated. Like it's probably the most 90s thing you'll see on basic cable that's not called third way centrism. But I would really like to see this movie get the mega mind treatment in the near future. If y'all know what that means, just go look at the memes. And then look at the love that that movie got because of the memes. But as is the case most times when I do videos like these, this thing really wound up becoming a lot deeper than I ever anticipated it being. So that being said, if y'all don't take anything else from this thing, let it be this. That I really think that it's time that we start giving Blade his flowers. And by we, I really mean y'all. And by y'all, I really mean those of y'all who just assume for whatever reason that comic book movies didn't exist until 2008 and until that time the rest of us were just stuck making our Batman and Stone Cold Steve Austin action figures fight to the death in that WWF Titan Tron that we got last Christmas because we couldn't find anybody to play Smackdown know your role with us and no I swear I'm not projecting my point is, if you've ever stood online to pre-purchase tickets to the midnight showing of the latest installment of the Avengers franchise, or if you, for whatever reason, have made the worship of a disheveled carnival worker the entirety of your personality, or if you're like half of YouTube and have used the MCU and its products as a vehicle to exploit straight white male fragility for clicks and clout, then... You got Nino Brown over here to thank for that. Pay your taxes, kids. Go birds. Fly, go fly on the road to victory. Fly, go fly. Go and touch down one, two, three. In a blow.